All right. Looks like we are live here on Standing for Truth. I want to welcome everybody to the show tonight. On Standing for Truth, as you know, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. And we have a very exciting program for everybody tonight. An exciting and very important program, I should say. I'm very pleased to say that we have once again with us Dr. Kent Hoven for a presentation on lies in the textbooks followed by an audience Q&A. So guys, please make sure you are tagging me at Standing for Truth. That way I will not miss your question. Now, Ken Hoven, he has been an incredible blessing to this ministry. He has helped us tremendously, including giving us his time for about 18 shows, including debates, interviews, and discussions. So please check the playlist titled Dr. Ken Hoven on Standing for Truth for all the previous shows uh, that I have had with, with Dr. Hoven. I've also got my award-winning co-host here with me tonight, George Bond. Uh, George, I know you are in the future all the way in Australia, but I want to thank you for joining me and Dr. Hoven for tonight's incredibly important show. George, uh, you are on mute, brother, if you had a couple words. Yeah, if you want to know the share price of uh, some of the companies you invest in, let me know and I'll uh, give you a heads up before you buy them. <laughs> very sweet of you, very sweet of you. And uh, Dr. Hoven, thank you so much for, for being here and giving us your time. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. George, I, I think you had a couple uh, introductory words, I think, before oh, we get into, into yeah, the yeah. Uh, presentation. Just, just, yeah, just for the audience, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. As uh, we say in Australia, good day, mate. And since the subject we're talking about is lies, it's not surprising that according to a... Um, a professor at the Montclair State University, I believe his name is Julian Keenan. This is what he said. He said, um, I'm quoting here, lying is a product of evolution. Therefore, if creationists fail to catch the lie, evolutionary ethics considered it considers it as a success. End quote. <laughs> so hence to an evolutionist, lying is just a product of evolution. It's not unethical. And and because everyone is here to actually listen to my joke, uh, uh, just one short joke. What are the two biggest <laughs> lies when working for a large corporation? Number one, hello, I'm from head office and I'm here to help you. Number two, <laughs> welcome, we're glad to have you. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I'll hand it over to you, Stanny. On that note, yes, thank you so much, George. I appreciate it. <laughs> And Dr. Hoven, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, for uh, your presentation. A few introductory words, if you'd like to, of course, but the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, thank you, sir. Good to be with you again, brother. Come on down and visit. We build stuff all the time down here. We are straight north of Pensacola, Florida, 70 miles out in the middle of no place, Alabama. Uh, and we believe the Bible is true. We're building a museum, a science center, a theme park, and it is really, really fun. All done with volunteers and donations. Some of the volunteers are a little more skilled than others, and some are a little less skilled than others, but we're, uh, we're having a blast down here. We don't really have a plan. Well, I just eat a lot of pizza with peanut butter on it before I go to bed, and you wake up at 2 in the morning with cool ideas. <laughs> that's, I'm not that's, talking about my daughter. that's another story. Okay, so there's all kinds of, uh, all kinds of fun stuff to do here. We have uh, four different tours now. Our barn tour, uh, the farm animals and stuff is incredible. The inside science center tour the outside tour of 140 acres and all the lakes and everything. We try to make everything have a science lesson with a spiritual application. The goal is to follow Jesus' example. He would tell his disciples, hey, consider the lilies. Why would I want to look at a flower? Well, they're beautiful and they don't worry about their clothes. Ah, science lesson, spiritual application. Consider the sparrows. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. So we've got probably nearly 500 science lessons we use that teach a spiritual truth. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. We just want to strengthen people's faith in the Word of God. I taught high school science 15 years, and I think evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the planet. This is the center of the new world order. You have to have people believing there's no absolute authority anywhere because then man gets to be the authority. I do a lot of debates with atheists. One of them told me, he said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? stumped him. 
How can you be absolutely sure there's no absolutes? Anyway, I like I like defending the Bible. I believe it's true. God made the earth about 6,000 years ago, made everything, sun, moon, stars, earth, dinosaurs, everything in six days. So one of my concerns, teaching high school science 15 years, and I collect science textbooks, and I speak at lots of schools and uh, churches and, and about 240 debates now at universities and stuff, they're lying to the kids. There are several just fundamental, simple lies that permeate everything. It generally starts <clears throat> with what they call their geologic column. You know, they had the movie Jurassic Park. Well, what's that about? The Jurassic Age. Well, what is that? Oh, yes, boys and girls, 65 million years ago in the Jurassic. There is no such thing as a Jurassic Age. There's no such thing as a geologic column. Here's what happened. Here's the history behind that. James Hutton in the 1700s wrote a book and said the earth is much older than people think. Up until about the 1700s, almost everybody said the earth is 6,000 years old, because if you add up the dates in the Bible, that's what you get, about 4,000 B.C. for the creation. I don't put an exact date on it and say it was 4,004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon. I do think Adam was made in the afternoon, though, because it was just before Eve. And I think God made Adam first because he didn't <laughs> want any advice on how to do it. Just mm -hmm. my humble opinion. Anyway, so... About 6,000 years was the history of the age of the earth, according to everybody, up until about 300 years ago. James Hutton said it's much older than that. He said the processes we see today is what's always been happening for a long time. So if you see Grand Canyon getting a little bit deeper as a roxy road, you can do the math and say, oh, wow, it loses a quarter inch a year. It's 5,000 feet deep. Do the math. Wow, this is really old. No. But his, his book that he wrote had a profound influence on a guy named Charles Lyell. <clears throat> Charles Lyell had a hatred for the Bible because of his lifestyle. People that like to sin don't like God's word. It kind of generally holds true. Charles Lyell invented what we call today the geologic column. And this is where the problem starts. Principles of Geology, the book that he wrote. He talked about a process called uniformitarianism. Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland that hated the Bible. Somebody told me one time they figured out that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. But Charles <laughs> Lyell wrote his book, Principles of Geology, in 1830. In that book, he invented what they still use today as the geologic column, still taught today, and it's not found any place in the world. It doesn't exist. He said, you can see his hatred for the Bible by reading his book. He said, men of superior talent, he's talking about himself, <clears throat> who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority. He said, you believe in an ancient doctrine and you have a scriptural authority. He's mocking the Bible is what he's doing. Uh, religion, as well as those of sound philosophy, have suffered perpetually by the mixing of sacred writings with questions of science. They don't think science fits with the Bible. Science fits perfectly fine with the Bible. Science doesn't fit with evolution, and the Bible doesn't fit with evolution, but science in the Bible fit fine. Lyle said you know, he reasoned philosophically against those who regarded the disordered state of Earth's crust as exhibiting signs of the wrath of God. See, up until Lyle's time, everybody would look at the layers in Grand Canyon and say, wow, there was a worldwide flood, and the water going up and down and in and out with the tides would make all these layers in one year. Charlie Lyle came along and started giving each layer a different name and an age. He said, you have a religious prejudice if you believe the Bible. He invented our geologic column, and he said deliberately his goal was to free the science from Moses. What do you suppose he meant by that? He doesn't like people looking at the rock layers and thinking, wow, this is evidence for a flood. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, at the end of time, there will be scoffers who will be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. And boy, have we got them today. Well, Lyle made up all these names, the Latin names, you know, the Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Mississippian, Devonian, all that stuff. The whole thing he made up in the 1800s, 1830s. It doesn't exist anywhere. He would name something like Jurassic. You say, well, how do you know how old the fossils are in that layer? Oh, that layer is 70 million, therefore the fossils have to be 70 million. Well, how do you know the fossils are 70 million? Because they're found in a 70 million year old layer. But how do you know the layer is 70 million? Well, because it contains a 70 million year old fossil. Pure circular reasoning. There is no geologic column anywhere. 
That's the Bible, though, to the evolutionist. And this is where the problem starts. And they're brainwashing the kids before they can even read. In kindergarten, they'll say, oh, yeah, during the Jurassic period, in the kindergarten, what's the Jurassic period? Oh, it's 70 million years ago. And the kids love dinosaurs, but they use dinosaurs to turn kids away from God. And by the time they've heard that for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way through high school or college, they're going to believe it. The layers are not different ages. If you shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? They say the top layer is younger. I say, stop, stop. Where's it coming from? Outer space? No. All the layers were on the earth at the same time. They got shuffled up. We have a demo we do here with a jar of rock, rock, sand, gravel, and water. You shake it up. It always settles into the same layer. Gravel, sand, clay, every time, without exception. Now, if you shake up a jar like that and it separates into gravel, sand, clay, is the top layer younger? No. They're all in the jar at the same time. They're all the same age. How can the top layer be younger? Is the material coming from outer space? They don't think about this. Wow, stop, think. There is no geologic column. Does it exist? No, it doesn't exist. Now, it's a fact the Earth has layers. That's a fact. It is not a fact they're millions of years old, but the evolutionist's interpretation of that fact is these layers form slowly over millions of times. I say stop right there and think about it. From where? Where's this new material coming from, guys? The creationist says the layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. It's a no-brainer. The atheists are always trying to erase that line between their theory and the interpretation. The, the fact is the earth has layers. Their theory is not a fact. It's a theory about the fact. Anyway, the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. It can only be found one place in the world, and that is the textbooks. And they admit it. This guy said, if there were a column of sediments, <clears throat> unfortunately, no such column <laughs> exists. I would suspect the author of that textbook got fired shortly thereafter. They have this geologic column. If the geologic column existed in one place, it'd be 100 miles thick. There is no geologic column. It's lie number seven I cover in my video series. People can get my whole series of 18 hours talking fast and using lots of slides, 50 bucks for the whole thing. Call 855-BIG-DINO. Uh, there's no geologic column. They talk about the Holdenville Shale. Well, here's the Perry Farm Shale. Here's the Nowata Shale. Here's the Bandera Shale. Mine Creek Shale. Wait a minute. How come there's shale scattered all through this geologic column? How do you tell the difference? If it's all shale, why do they give it different ages? Ah, this is where the joke comes in. Let's see, there's limestone. Limestone, 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 limestone. Wow. Now, what's the difference between 70 million year old limestone and 200 million year old limestone? <laughs> it's limestone. There's no difference. The article is a detailed examination of the young earth creationist claim that the geologic column does not exist. It shows that the entire geologic column exists in North Dakota. Oh, they found one place where they think the layers are in the order that they want them to be. They should be in that same order all over the world. They're not. Out of the 12 layers of the geologic column, it's just random chance. Of course, you're going to find limestone shale slate in a certain order once in a while. And one place found it in North Dakota. So this is the Minakata limestone, which was deposited in hypersaline waters. Wow. Well, during the flood, the crust of the earth would be all busted up. The best, and I taught earth science 15 years and love studying this, the best way to explain the tangled up mess the crust of the earth is in is from the Bible. The Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken open. Well, there used to be water under the crust of the earth. Genesis 1 says God made the earth and divided the waters which were under the earth from the waters which were above. There used to be, God said he founded the earth upon the seas. What's now in our oceans, uh, great, hang on, great big oceans out here, uh, the earth today is 71% underwater, 29% above water. There's enough water out there in the oceans. If you smoothed out the earth right now today, the water would cover the earth 8,800 feet deep, a mile and a half, plenty to drown in. So there, one atheist said, if there was a worldwide flood, where'd all that water go? It's still here. It's in the oceans. God formed the earth to be inhabited, the Bible says, and today only 3% of it is habitable. So something happened. 
I think it got destroyed by a flood. But the fountains of the deep breaking open and that water shooting out explains a lot of things. And I cover that in my video number six. So index fossils might have been found in order in some place. That's a result of random shuffling. Of course, they find fossil. They, they talk about the fossil record. I say, stop, guys. There is no such thing as a fossil record. When you find a fossil like this petrified clam, you should notice immediately two things. Number one, it does not talk. Nope. Number two, it does not have a date stamped on it. It doesn't say made by a clam in 38 million BC. It doesn't say that. How do you tell the age of a fossil? Only one way. Where did you find it? Take a fossil to any university and say, how old is this fossil? First question they ask, oh, where did you find it? What difference does that make? Well, they want to find their geologic chart and say, oh, that's from the, you know, Cenozoic era. They date the fossils by the layers they come from. These layers that we see all over the world are interesting. If it, that layer sat there for 4 million years waiting for the next one, don't you think it's going to rain once in a while in 4 million years and create some gullies and erosion marks? Why are they all stacked like pancakes? Where's the erosion marks between the layers? They may find them occasionally rare, okay, but it should be all over. But these layers, nice, neat stratification are found everywhere. You take a jar of sand, gravel, clay, shake it up, it'll settle into layers. You ever seen them little sand things? You flip it over, makes 20 or 30 or 40 layers in a matter of seconds. We flip ours. We got a couple of them down at the cliff. We showed the kids. This was a gravel pit for years, and you can see the seven layers of gravel. Gravel, sand, clay, gravel, sand, clay. So I say to boys and girls, how did we get all these gravel layers in Lenox, Alabama? Well, the moon pulls the water up on the earth and makes a bump called the high tide. It holds that bump like a magnet while we spin around. So here's the moon holding up a bump of water. And I get where you can see it. Uh, I can't. The picture's not big enough. Okay. The moon pulls up a bump about five feet in Florida, and the earth is spinning around. So as the earth spins around, that bump stays right under the moon, the, the bump of water. The moon never sees low tide, but the people on Earth get to see high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. It would change every six hours, but the moon's also moving once a month around the Earth, so it ends up six hours, 12 and a half minutes. Who cares? Anyway, the tidal change goes up and down about five feet in Florida because it bangs into something called Florida. It's stuff, there's stuff sticking up through the water called continents. But during the flood, they wouldn't have that. If you smoothed out the world and the earth was did not have these big continents sticking up through, the tide would not get interrupted and the tide would become a harmonic tide. Musicians know about harmonics. It would very quickly become a 200-foot tidal change. If the water came up and down 200 feet, well, it came up 200 feet in six hours, 12 and a half minutes, where'd all the water come from to fill that bump? It's being dragged sideways by moon's gravity at the same speed the earth is turning. Here in Lenox, Alabama, we're 31 degrees above the equator. You can do all the trig on that. There's Lenox, Alabama right there. You get sine, cosine, tangent, and say, okay, bottom one. Look at that. Lenox, Alabama, adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. Wow, at, at 0.8541267. Man, we are traveling 886 miles an hour. Right now, right here, we're going 886 miles an hour toward the left, toward the east. Well, Suppose, I mean, at the equator, you're going 1,037, Atlantic's 886. Okay. Well, that means the water's rushing into that bump at that same speed. If the water's moving laterally at 800 miles an hour, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to move a bunch of sediments in a flash. It's going to be dragging things around because the water's moving 900 miles an hour. It makes what's called a turbidity current, and it would automatically separate them into layers. Gravel, sand, clay. Gravel, sand, clay just like our little toy does here. And it would take all the rocks and roll them against each other and round them off like a rock tumbler does. You can take a rock tumbler and tumble rocks around and get them all nice and shiny and just rolling them around against each other. During the flood, the whole earth was a giant rock tumbler. Gravel all over the world is rounded. And they keep calling it river rock. Guys, the gravel layers we're digging in here in Lenox go all the way to North Carolina. That would have been a wide river. No, it's flood rock. Take, come take a look. Take, take some home with you. We, how many rocks do we have around here? Billions. Billions. We plenty. Take a few home, okay? These layers form quickly. But the kids are taught the layers are different ages. 
and they have to memorize this stupid stuff like Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. It is absolutely insane. It's not true. The Bible says they delight in lies. Textbooks talk about exposing fossils long buried in sedimentary rocks. Colorado River cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Absolute baloney. We got a whole demo. We come down to see Dinosaur Adventureland. We do a demo on the rapid formation of canyons. Grand Canyon probably formed in a week, not millions of years. So one of the lies we cover in our textbook is about that river did not make that canyon. Then they tell the kids, well, in the fossil record, I say, stop right there. There is no fossil record. It doesn't exist. Fossils don't talk. There's no date on them. You're putting your interpretation on them. First place, fossils don't form today at all in any significant numbers. How many animals got died today in the world, would you guess? Billions. How many are going to fossilize? None. Why not? They don't get buried. Fossilization only occurs when an animal is buried quickly. There is no such thing as a fossil record. But the textbooks teach the kids, oh, yes, boys and girls, the fossil record. Stop right there. They're lying. There is no fossil record. No fossils count as evidence for evolution, of course. When you find a bone in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids. You sure couldn't prove it had different kids. No animal today is capable of producing offspring other than its same kind. I bet if this clam had any babies, they would turn out to be clams. I'd be willing to bet five bucks on that. Maybe I might have seven in my wallet, seven bucks. Uh, all we've ever seen in the history of the world, every farmer will tell you, cows produce cows. You plant grass, you get grass. You plant corn, you get corn. There are no exceptions. But the atheist wants our kids to believe that corn and cows and bananas and whales are all related. That is absolute insanity. They say, well, yeah, if you give it enough time, adding time won't help. Time makes it worse. Everything falls apart. Adding energy won't help. We added a bunch of energy to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and didn't organize a thing for them over there. So this geologic column, I think, is one of the most serious lies in the textbooks that kids are taught. I cover many, about 50 lies in the textbooks on my video number four of my series you can get for 50 bucks. Um, and then, by the way, brother, it's not copyrighted. You can copy it or keep it. or But if you send it back, get your money back, minus the cost of the shipping. I used to loan my videos out when I started. I learned immediately Baptists don't steal, but they do borrow and never return. So I'm like, no, you got to buy it. Then you can get your money back after afterwards, okay? But the textbooks teach the kids that the embryo, the baby growing inside the mother, has gills like a fish. This, to me, is one of the most serious lies in the textbooks that they teach. Have I gone too long? He told me to go 20 minutes. Is it 25, 30? Well, you take your time, Dr. Hoven. Oh, one more lie. I like this one. They say the embryo has gills. This is lie number 12 in my video series, number four. Evidence of evolution from development. What are they saying here? The similarity between early stages of development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. What was it that talked Charlie into believing in evolution? The embryos look similar, he said. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. Ernst Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. He said, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. What does that mean? A bunch of Latin words. It means as the baby grows, it grows through the stages of evolution. Just remember the word farm, F-A-R-M, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. Yes, when the baby first starts growing, it's a fish. And then it goes through the amphibian stage, and then the reptile stage, and then the mammal stage, farm, F-A-R-M. The presence of these fish-like structures in embryos shows these animals have evolved from fish. Notice the baby human looks identical to the baby fish. In the drawing, it's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins. This is stuff kids are taught in school and have to be tested on. Sick mind Freud said this, this was his idea behind his theories. Oh, yeah. Man used to be, he's just, she's stuck in the fish stage or amphibian stage or reptile stage. Insane. Those are not gill slits. This is a lie, lie number 12 in my series. Those little folds of skin on the baby that you see developing in the mother develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Never have anything to do with breathing. Nothing. I've seen fat folks got five or six chins. They can't breathe through any of them except the top one. I can understand why Bill ran around. Never mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book. 
Darwin's book influenced Haeckel. By 1868, many evolutionists were worried about the lack of evidence for the theory. So Ernst Haeckel, one of those worried evolutionists, decided to manufacture some evidence. He made up some frauds. He, he created a family tree to prove evolution, but he was worried about the big gap between non-living and living organisms. I mean, to go from dust to anything alive, even a bacteria, is a giant, giant leap. So to complete the chart, Haeckel created some organisms. He called them a Monera. There is no Monera, no such thing. He claimed to have discovered these organisms in ocean mud samples. He named them Bathobius Haeckeli in honor of Haeckel, a non-existent creature that he made up. 1876, a chemist, John Buchanan, revealed Huxley's discovery was simply calcium sulfate from seawater. Wasn't a half-living creature. He lied. Haeckel refused to admit his fraud and re reprinted the Monera, the non-existing creatures, in his book. His fraud was continued with the attempt to prove the only difference between man and ape is that man can speak. He fraudulently created a missing link, Pithecanthropus alalis, the speechless ape man. He even went so far as to have artist Max Gabriel Marx draw up the man-made creature, put him in a cave, half man, half monkey, from no evidence at all, none, zero. This is a lie. Haeckel reached an all-time low when he presented the biogenetic law, the idea that the baby has gill slits. He taught that each animal retraces the stages of, stages of its evolution. He took a drawing of a human and a dog embryo growing inside the mother and changed them and made them look exactly alike. On top are the real drawings. Underneath are his drawings. He lied. Now, Haeckel was a good artist, but Haeckel took drawings of all kinds of creatures in the embryonic stage and changed them to make them look alike to help prove the evolution theory. He lied. This is a lie, and the kids are still taught this today. On top are Haeckel's drawings compared to actual photographs of what he claimed he's drawing. His own university held a trial and said, Haeckel, you teach here, you are lying. University of Jena convicted him of fraud. And he said, a small percentage of my embryonic drawings are forgeries. Those namely for which the observed material is so incomplete and insufficient as to fill in and reconstruct the missing links by hypothesis and comparative synthesis. I should feel utterly condemned, but everybody else lies. That was his excuse. I know I lied, but it's okay because everybody lies. That was Ernst Haeckel at the University of Jena. Even though it was proven to be a fake in the late 1700s, Darwin continued to use it as the most important evidence for evolution. He said in his second book that he wrote, The Descent of Man, the human embryo itself at a very early period can hardly be distinguished from that of other members of the vertebrate kingdom. All that fraud stuff was brought to the public in 1911 in Haeckel's Frauds and Forgeries. The pictures were fakes. Why is this still in textbooks today in your town? George, check the Australian textbooks. Are they still teaching the embryo has gill slits? Proven wrong in 1874? I think it's yeah. time to get that out of there. Yes, I remember being taught that at school. Yep. It is a fake. It is a lie. Embryonic liar. A uh, doctor from England did a study on that. He said, look, this is fake. This is just a lie. So he said the biogenetic law as proof for evolution is valueless. That was 50 years ago. They knew it wasn't true. The biogenetic law is so deeply rooted in biological thought, it cannot be weeded out. 1969, the year I got saved. 1988, they said the biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. Haeckel was convicted of fraud at his own university, but they keep using the drawings. Here's the University of West Florida textbook in Pensacola 20 years ago. 2005 textbook in North Dakota, still using Haeckel's fake drawings. The exact drawings, same chart. So Haeckel, or Darwin published his book, 1859. Haeckel faked his drawings in 1869. He was convicted of fraud in 1875, but they still teach him. Biology textbook from Holt, one of the top four publishers, still teaching the young embryo that suggests evolution from a distant common ancestor because of the gill folds, gill slits, Glencoe biology. Tim Barra still teaching, 115 years after it's teaching wrong. Tim, you ought to be embarrassed. You ought to be fired, okay? 
Here's uh, Haeckel's fake drawings used in Kenneth Miller, who was a Catholic teacher in Ken, uh, New England state, still teaching. We have gill slits. Kenneth, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You are lying. You better go say 55 million Hail Marys, full of grapes, swinging beads all over the place. Swing them low, swing them high. Come on, Mary, go, go, go. You are in trouble, son. <laughs> It just frustrates me that these lies are still in the books. I mean, I collect them. They're sitting right here. Google it. Embryonic development. They're still teaching it. Human and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. That's a lie. Not true. So they make up this fake stuff. Now, here's why this is important, though. This idea that teaching the baby growing in the mother has gills and is therefore a fish. That means it's not human yet. So during the nine months of development, it's okay to kill it because it hasn't reached the human stage yet. This is why this lie, proven wrong 130 years ago, is important because it justifies abortion. It all ties together. Gill slits. It's on the test the kids take for the SAT. You won't get a high score on your SAT unless you give a lie for an answer about gill slits. Just watch my video number four. I got a ton of stuff on that if you want more on that. Let's see. So here's why it's important. Kent State University is still using it. I debated uh, Rachel Oates in England. She said, I'm lying because no one is using gill slits as evidence for evolution. Rachel, you are way behind the times. 2017 textbook. Embryology, blogspot.com. Evolution with embryology at BioZoom. Evolution with embryology at Rational Conclusions. They're still using Haeckel's drawings. Why not use the photographs? They've been available for a long time, you know. Nope, still using Haeckel's drawings at SlideShare. Richard Peacock, still using it. All life forms have gill slits, tails, and anatomical structures. You guys are just either lying or stupid or evil. I can't figure it out. Gill slits, Encyclopedia Botanica, still teaching that. Embryology and evolutionary history, gill slits. I, I, I can update this today if you'd like, but it doesn't make any difference. They still use it. As evident, embryonic development, evidence for evolution. This is, to me, one of the more serious lies, and it, you, I find it all over the Internet, and thousands of examples of it. Em gill slits on the embryo, gill slits, gill slits, gill slits. They're just plain lying. Why? Well, they want to justify abortion. Evolution news. Ev it's a gill slits, yep. Yes, I really did an ultrasound guided abortion that made me pro-life. Yep. One of my debates I did. Do human embryos have gills? Ben Wagner, who teaches, who claims he believes the Bible, Ben Wagner said, oh yeah, the baby has gill slits. Those are the folds of skin they're talking about as the embryo develops. They do grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Humans never have gills, and our gill slits don't normally open up the way fish gills do, but we definitely do have the same basic structures, pharyngeal arches, that go on to form gills in fish. We've just evolved to modify them for our purposes other than extracting oxygen. Ben Wagner, I'll debate you again any time, son. Half my brain tied behind my back. Bring it on, okay? You and the whole biology department in Arkansas. Okay? Bring every atheist you can find in Arkansas, every evolution. All, I get half the time. Professor Dave, I still teach in the embryo, has evidence for evolution from homology. Dave, get up to speed, son. You're about 130 or 40 years behind the times in your science. Those are not gill slits. All liars have their part in the lake of fire. This fires me up, this whole topic, because how many babies have been murdered? How many Google? How many kids have been killed by abortion? Millions. 20 or 30 million, I think, just in America. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not kill. Uh, Benjamin Spock, back in the 50s, and a lot of kids got spocked instead of spanked. He said each child, as he develops, is retracing the whole history of mankind, physically and spiritually, step by step. The baby starts off in the womb as a tiny, single tiny cell, just the way the first living thing appeared in the ocean. Weeks later, in the amniotic fluid, he has gills like a fish. Now, Benjamin Spock said that 75 years after it was proven wrong. Dr. Spock. Gill slits, it's, it's just all over the place in all the textbooks. By seven months, the fetus looks like a normal human tiny baby, but it's not. How many? Since 1972, 50 million. Since 1972, 50 million. Is that just in America? Yeah. 50 million. Since 1972. Yeah. 
It's a human at conception. The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. Is that what he said? No, I said, Thou art with child. It's a child before it's born. Scott Peterson is accused of murdering his wife and unborn child. Oh, 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 with CNN, the Communist News Network, said it's an unborn child. No, why? Because California has a law, you can't get the death penalty unless you have two murders. So he murdered his wife, and the baby died, resultant of that. So they said, oh, he murdered his wife and child. Well, Paula, you hypocrite. If it, somebody wanted to have an abortion, you wouldn't call it a child, would you? Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his wife and son. Yeah. 34% of babies born at five and a half months will survive. Probably higher now. That was back 20 years ago. You know, you're a nurse. Is it, can you find out the stats? How many percentage? And five and a half months along. I mean, three and a half months before it ought to be born. They're still surviving. Yeah, they're surviving. 34% of them. Probably almost 100% now. Can a fetus live on its own? According to studies in 2003 and 2005, 20 to 30% of babies born at 24 weeks survive. It gives the stats here. There's a 21-week-old baby growing in the mother holding the doctor's finger. Doctor did surgery on the baby before it was born. Cut into the uterus right there. Here's a 12-week embryo. It's a human. It doesn't have gill slits. That book, Icons of Evolution, covers it. They keep it in the textbooks. That's the only way to justify abortion. See, the population of the earth has grown from the time of Noah's flood, when eight people got off the ark, to six billion people in the year 2000. The population growth curve is a great evidence that man, is not, man has not been here for millions of years. But the goal of the New World Order is to reduce the population to a half billion. Anna Rosa's arm was chopped off in a botched abortion when her mother was seven and a half months pregnant. I lived in Pensacola for 30 years. We had the group come there, the National Organization of Wild Women, now, and they had their shirts, choice above all, choice above all. Is this choice for the mother or choice for the baby? Does the dad get a choice in this? How about the grandparents? Do they get a choice in this? Do the neighbors get a choice? Tell you what, if you had a family that was killing their kids that were two and three years old next door to you, you could call the police, couldn't you? The neighbors have a choice in that, don't they? Why don't they have a choice in whether the neighbor aborts their unborn baby? Huh? Well, Peter Singer at Princeton University said, we should be allowed to kill kids after they're born for the first month. Just decide if you want to keep it. How many of you mothers had a baby in the first couple of weeks you thought, this kid wakes me up in the middle of the night. Come on, knock it off, kid. I mean, yeah. I know parents with a kid that's five years old think about killing them once in a while. <laughs> One more time, son. I'm going to abort you. <laughs> Pro-choice. Pro, it's not pro-choice. It's pro-death. Media is ignoring the wishes of the minority. And this liberal paper missed the, joint, missed the point purposely. Legislature pulls gun bill. Yeah. Kids were killed in Denver public schools. The public and Rosie O'Donnell jumped on the gun control issue. Hold it. The real issue is should we have public schools, first of all? Okay. If we're going to have them, should we teach them evolution? That's what happened to uh, Klebold and, uh, and, uh, and Eric Harris. They were strong believers in evolution. <clears throat> he said in a, writing back and forth to his friend, he, talking about a football player, doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. Dylan Klebold on the video he and Eric made prior to the shootings. Klebold's father was a geologist who believed in evolution. Both Eric and Dylan were followers of Nazi teachings. The shooting took place on Hitler's birthday on purpose. He had a shirt that said, serial killer. They shot Isaiah just because he was black. And then they jump on the gun control issue. Blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. It's not the spoon's fault, Rosie. Okay, And it's not the gun's fault either. Okay, Should certain criminals be publicly executed? Maybe all law-abiding citizens should be required to carry guns. Maybe that's what we ought to think about. Proudly unarmed. Somebody sent me that pin. Would you wear that? What does that say to a criminal? Rob me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. proudly unarmed. Come on. Anyway, we can talk about all that. Um, here's the reasons they used to justify abortion. They're going to say it's not a human. That's a lie proven wrong in 1875. Try again. They say it's not viable. It can't live on its own. Neither are you viable, stark naked on the North Pole, okay? Who's viable anyway? They say, well, child might be unwanted. 
I know a, kid, a lot of kids that are unwanted. Doesn't mean we should allow to kill them. Anyway, this, um, they say it might be a financial burden. Show me a kid that's not. Is your daughter a financial burden? Yeah. <laughs> might be from rape or incest. Well, that's 1%. And in that case, we should kill the rapist, not the mm -hmm. baby. Insane. Anyway, so one of the lies in the textbooks that I, I bother, am bothered by deeply is this, this one about the gill slits on the human embryo. I've gone long enough, but watch my video number four. I cover about, I'm guessing, 30 of the lies in the textbooks. There are probably at least 70. I should do more on that. I'm doing more with my Whack and Atheist Wednesday night on my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official, with uh, Mr. Larry Nelson, who calls himself R. and Ra, the sun god. <laughs> having, a lot, having a lot of fun with that one. I can't wait for the next one. I've already got it ready. I was working on it today thinking, I wish it was tonight. <laughs> next Wednesday, we're going to smack them again. Okay. Anyway, so questions you guys got there. That's the kind of stuff we cover in our seminar. Uh, we believe the Bible is true. God made man in his own image, and it's murder to kill an unborn child. Okay? Amen, brother. Amen. Well said. Fantastic presentation, as always. And we've got a ton of great questions and feedback from the audience. Lots of... Uh, positive comments towards you, Dr. Oven. You've been such a blessing to so many. And personally, I recommend your creation seminar to everybody as it changed my life years ago. I was a stubborn evolutionist coming out of college, but under the recommendation of my brother who uh, got saved through your work, I watched your seminar, including the famous lies in the textbook, which I could watch over and over again and was surprised, Dr. Hoven, to realize I have been lied to all through grade school, high school, and college. So thank you so much for the, a fantastic presentation, Ken. Thank you. Uh, George, you uh, may have a couple of words before we get into some questions, brother. Yeah, yeah. My, my experience was similar to yours, uh, Stanley. I remember watching Dr. Ken Hovind uh, debate those three professors. And uh, I was gobsmacked, to be honest. I've never heard arguments like that. So thank you, Dr. Hovind. Well, you're welcome. That was fun. Just type in, uh, where did God come from? By Kent Hovind. That little, <laughs> I've, my two minute answer has got 70 million views. Yeah. I've seen that number of, <laughs> number of times, but there, there, there's, there's, uh, there's somebody in the chat, uh, Dr. Hovind, who um, brings up fossils and phylogeny a lot. But before, before we get to his question, I just want to read a very short uh, excerpt that I took from a recent article. It's from, it's a press release from the American Museum of Natural History, okay? This okay. sums up the gist of that review article. It was uh, dated May the 6th, 2021, phys.org. I'm, I'm quoting here. It won't take long. Intriguingly, such narratives have not drastically changed since Darwin. We must be aware of confirmation biases and ad hoc interpretations by researchers aiming to confer their new fossil, the starring role, within a pre-existing narrative. Evolutionary scenarios are appealing because they provide plausible explanations based on current knowledge, but unless grounded in testable hypotheses, they are no more than just so stories. Amen. Overall the researchers found that most stories of human origins are not compatible with the fossils that we have today, end quote. Amen, brother. Amen. Well, then that um, would bring me to the first question, Dr. Hoven, where we've got a ton of questions. We've got a great lively chat tonight. So I'm going to take multiple questions and fuse them into one. Okay, so what are your thoughts in general, uh, Kent, on phylogeny? Because the evolutionists will claim that we can classify organisms based on traits, morphology, genetics. Aaron Ra really likes to look to phylogeny as well. Does this actually demonstrate common descent? Well, the fact that there are similarities between different organisms would demonstrate a common creator, wouldn't it? I think you'd find a lot of similarities between the Honda Prelude and the Honda Accord. What does that mean? They both evolved from a skateboard? No, they're coming from the same brains that are the same, you know, same engineers designing them. So I think for God to create different creatures that have similarities is logical. Uh, I've got two arms. A lot of creatures have two arms. Well, that's pretty handy to be able to hold things and grab things. You know, three would be a little uncomfortable. You couldn't get your shirt on. So I think uh, 
it, it, it's, it's, it's evidence for design, not common ancestor at all. If somebody chooses to believe that, it's, that's, that's, a, that's a religious choice, not a scientific choice. Amen. Amen, Kent. Well said, well said. Well, this brings me to this question, and this is, I'm sure you're familiar with this throughout, uh, you know, your hundreds of debates, essentially, but uh, does natural selection help the evolutionists at all in terms of driving large-scale evolution? Well, natural selection only selects. It can't create anything. If you said, uh, we're going to let all the uh, horses run across the field and anybody that runs across the field too slow, we're going to shoot them, okay? And so you gradually shoot the, the slow horses. Eventually, you end up with a, a herd of horses that are fast runners. Now, okay, you have selected speed uh, for what survives in that case. And so then you only crossbreed the fast runners, and pretty soon you realize, wow, I got all fast runners, but they don't ever get up to 1,000 miles an hour. I mean, you're not creating anything new. You're selecting something already in the gene code. If you went to a country and said, we want everybody here to be over six feet tall, so you shoot everybody under six feet tall and only let those that are over six foot breed. Okay, well, after a few hundred years of that, you'll have a bunch of six footers, but you'll never get 30 footers. It's not in the gene code. You're not selecting. Selection doesn't create. See, the evolutionist gets it all screwed up in their little brain. They think selection can create something. No, it can select. That's all it can do. Amen. Well said. And, and as we know, uh, Kent, then what they look to is mutations. And Aaron Ra looked to this recently in one of his videos that you uh, demolished in, in such a, a perfect way in, in your last whack and atheist that was so good and I recommend it for everybody So they'll look to mutations as a way to generate novel genetic information and complexity as Aaron Ra puts it Does the science support th this claim dr. Hoven along with natural selection of course, which you just addressed But can mutations drive large-scale fish to fisherman evolution? Absolutely not Mutation is a scrambling, something goes wrong in the gene code. Some, some child is born with a mutation, like no arms or you know, no legs or something, or blind or something like that. All known mutations are harmful or fatal or neutral. They do nothing. If you had a beneficial mutation and nobody's ever proven one, but if there was a beneficial mutation, now you got to get another one in the opposite sex at the same time, in the same place. It's a big world, you know. And they got to find each other and be interested. And then they got to take over the whole population of people. So in the evolutionist little bitty brain, they think a mutation happens, drives an animal a little better than the rest. Okay. Well, now the rest of them have to die. See, the, the, this is such a fundamental difference. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. Trillions of creatures that weren't quite well formed enough had to die and here we are we made it we're the king of the world It's what Hitler said to I mean what uh, Satan said to Eve You do what I say honey and ye shall be as gods That's what evolution. It's the same thing. It's a lie from the devil. It's all it is uh, So no mutations er, nobody's proven a good one Nobody if there were one one you got to take over the whole population with this one it just is a, it's a fairy tale. They believe it. Okay. I don't care if you believe it, but it's not science. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Okay. Go ahead. Amen. Well said. And I like to point out, Dr. Hoban, that it's even worse for the evolutionists in terms of mutations, because even the so-called neutral mutations are slightly deleterious. And I like to compare it to rust on a car. Those mutations build up and degenerate. So they're not going to take a single cell like ancestor into a whale over billions of years through information loss. As you put it, Kent, uh, quite frequently, and, and I really like it, uh, we are a copy of a copy of, of a copy of Adam. It's lucky uh, that, that we could function at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, George, actually, I'll go to this yeah. question, and then George, I know you got a couple questions because this one's still related to selection mutations. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it over and over again, uh, Kent. They will then say, well, we've got gene duplication. <laughs> gene duplication can add meaningful information, and then selection can act upon that duplicated gene, and then we can get something novel. Is there any truth to this? Well, what they're talking about is called polyploidy, that instead of, you know, uh, certain chromosome just makes an exact copy of itself. 
So if I said, I'm going to give you this book, no, better yet, I'm going to give you seven copies of this book. It's the same information seven times. So there are no new information is added with polyploidy. Gene duplication is simply a doubling of the existing information. It's not going to help anything. So Amen. they're green. They think that's going to cause evolution. And then in, in those additional copies of the book that you already own, Kent, if you started introducing spelling mistake into those additional copies, you're only going to get a, a worse off book than the original book. So once again, it's still still downhill. Yep. Um, George, brother, I know you had a couple questions as well uh, uh, that you wanted to get to. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought it was important to let Dr. Hoven know about some of the comments that are coming through. Um, since he spent some time on Haeckel's drawings, I found it interesting that cover to cover book reviews, uh, that's one of the subscribers in the chat at the moment, said, um, standing for truth, my niece was being taught in school about Haeckel's embryo drawings. She stood up in front of the entire class and refuted Haeckel's claims using your information. Thanks, Dr. Hovind. I thought it was hey. important for you to know that. When I hold it, George, why are we sending kids off to war? The parents ought to be fighting this battle. Get that stuff out of your textbooks. Kids Correct. should be able to read the book and trust it. The parents choose the books, you know. Somebody's picking that book. It's a battle Correct. the parents ought to be fighting. I'm, praise God for the kids standing up, but it's sad that it got that far. Uh, correct, Dr. Owen. My, my daughter's actually a microbiologist. She's involved in research. And I actually uh, quizzed her a couple of times about um, whether she knew anything about um, soft tissues in, in dinosaurs. And she goes, no, that's impossible. She goes, they died out 65 million years ago. And I said, you better read up on it. So they're not being told a lot of these truths that we're finding. But um, a question that came in from... Um, uh, Ramen Goiza Dango, uh, th this is something that I keep reading too. Uh, he, he says, why are their story is changing to local catastrophe everywhere instead of super long time deposition? I think he's talking about all the stories of local flooding instead of one super long uh, flood. Well, people don't like the idea of a worldwide flood because that obviously demonstrates that God has authority to destroy his creation if he wants. In 2 Peter 3, it says the scoffers will be willingly ignorant of the creation. They don't want to admit God created it because that would mean he owns it. And that would mean he could make the rules. And they don't like his rules, like the thou shalt not kind of stuff, you know. They don't want to admit there was a flood because that demonstrates God has authority to judge his creation. So they'll say, oh, yeah, we had a local flood here in South Carolina. We also had one in North Carolina. We had another one in Tennessee and another one in Georgia and another one in, you know, the whole world shows evidence of a flood. I mean, it's all over the place. You find petrified trees standing up. I got pictures of those. One, oh, eight, eight. Petrified trees standing up, running through all these layers. They're telling the kids the layers are different ages. How long does a dead tree stand around in your neighborhood before it falls over? You know, four or five years? Polystrata fossils. They find them all over the world. Petrified me by one in Yellowstone, standing up, petrified in the vertical position. This had to, the layers had to form quickly. So the local catastrophe idea is crazy. They find petrified clams in the closed position on top of Mount Everest. I think maybe there was a worldwide flood. No, I don't think the water was over Mount Everest. This is a critical difference. Mount Everest was under the water. The Bible says in Psalm 104, toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valleys sank down. If the earth was covered with water and the crust of the earth was cracked up like an eggshell, the plates of the earth would still be shifting around and moving from water underneath, escaping along the cracks. Then a plate of earth the size of Texas would tip a mile and the water would run down into the low spot, make a mountain range here and a low spot here. All the, all the mountain ranges in the world follow the coastlines. Rocky Mountains follow the North Pacific. Appalachians follow the North Atlantic. The Andes Mountains follow the South Pacific. Why do all the mountain ranges follow the coastlines? They were formed at the same time from the same thing. It's the crust of the earth shifting around and the water being reshuffled. Now, 71% of the earth is underwater and some of it's above water. Praise God. That's where I live. <laughs> great answer. Great response, uh, Dr. Hoven. That brings me to 
the next question here that's uh, related to the flood, now that we're kind of moving on to, to the flood, um, the question is, is there too much coal and oil today to explain in just 6,000 years? I, I know you've addressed this many times, Kent, but it's it's still an argument that is that is being put forth by the atheists over and over again. Well, here's a picture of a coal mine. I've been to many, many coal mines. I've got a lot of friends that work there. They send me samples of coal, the different types, anthracite, bituminous, subbituminous, lignite, et cetera. I'm very familiar with this. I taught her science 15 years. One lady I debated said, there's so much coal in the world. If you took every tree and blade of grass in the world and pressed it and heated it and turned it into coal, you couldn't make all the coal we find in the world today. I said, that's right. She said, see, that proves it takes millions of years. I said, no, that proves the world before the flood was very different. God created it to be inhabited. Today, it's 71% underwater where no trees are growing. If the pre-flood world was, let's just pick a number and say it was 90% land and 10% water because the water was trapped under the crust of the earth. He founded the earth upon the seas. So for the first 1600 years of earth's history, it was loaded with trees. We know the trees were much bigger because they find fossils of them that are just ginormous, you know. Uh, so the world was very different before the flood. That's the world that perished. And so the coal would have formed in the flood because the pre-flood world was loaded. If the moon's pulling the water up and the earth is turning at this latitude, 886 miles an hour, that means the water's rushing in sideways at 886 miles an hour. Well, that would knock all the trees down and bury them under a layer of mud 100 feet thick in 30 seconds and form coal over the next 20 years. They can make coal in the laboratory in 20 minutes. Take a piece of wood under heat and pressure, you can change it to coal in 20 minutes. It does not take millions of years. So if it's buried deeper and deeper under thousands of feet of rock, how much would a thousand feet of rock weigh? A lot. And it would squeeze the layers into different types of coal, anthracite, bituminous, et cetera. So the coal form because of the pre-flood world getting buried. So yeah, there is more coal out there in the world today than we could possibly form today. That does not prove it took millions of years. That proves the pre-flood world was different. That's all it proves. It had a lot more trees to bury. Okay. Just, well, that's a great, I'll just, say this, George, and then I'll hand it over to yeah. you because uh, so many great points there. And it makes me think about this argument that, that evolutionists use. They claim that there's too much heat that would have been generated as a result of the flood for the, the flood to be true. But based on what you're saying, Kent, I have a feeling that a lot of the heat would have been absorbed in the rapid production of coal, natural gas, and oil there would have been essentially a canceling out effect. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Ken? Well, that, it, it would be canceled out many different ways. One is with the, the rocks and stuff absorbing this heat. But if the earth indeed had a canopy above, like I strongly believe, I covered that in video number two, there was water above the firmament, talks about in Genesis chapter one and chapter two. There was actually a couple, the Jews have always taught it was a layer of ice, two or three fingers thick. So a couple inches of ice, pick a number, say 10 miles up. The whole earth is encased inside a crystalline ball of ice, super cold ice, maybe 10 miles off the surface. Well, super cold ice is magnetic. You get ice down cold enough, it becomes magnetic. The molecules actually rearrange, the hydrogen oxygen molecules rearrange and it becomes laminate, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen. Right? You can hit it with a hammer and it spreads out, you can beat it like gold, it's malleable. That's another long story I cover in video too. But if the crust of the earth broke open and shot stuff up and cracked that canopy, as it begins to rain, you get a problem where it releases heat called the latent heat of condensation. I understand. So the atmosphere would heat up from the rain. But if the earth is, if the air is able now to expand away from the earth from 10 miles out to its current 60 miles, just the expansion of the air would absorb the heat. Get a spray can of anything, spray paint, hairspray, and hold the button down. It'll get cold in your hand. As the pressure is relieved, it, the, the, it gets cooled off. So I think the cooling effect of the expanding atmosphere and also, like you mentioned, the turning coal, uh, turning trees into coal absorbs a lot of heat. All the uh, just the pressure would be a lot of factors to study on that. I don't think it's logical to reject the biblical view of a flood because somebody can't figure out where the heat went. I think that's insane. Mm, great response. I, I completely agree. I uh, can't. Great answer. Uh, George, I, I apologize. I know you're going to say something earlier. Uh, uh, George, the floor is yours, brother. Uh, that's OK. I was just going to add to what uh, Kent was saying about the coal. Uh, we know with carbon dating, it's all based around the C14 to C12 ratio. Uh, 
they they assume the secular scientists assume that the that ratio has remained constant. But based on what uh, Kent has uh, mentioned regarding all the coal, the oil, the gas that's stored in the earth, that C14 to C12 ratio would have been much, much different in the past. And hence the ages that they get for these carbon dating samples is completely out of whack. And that could explain a lot of these um, dates that we get that are 50 odd thousand years, 40 odd thousand years uh, and so forth. So that's what I, I, I wanted to add to, to that discussion. I appreciate that, George. Did you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm curious, 14, carbon 14, is that similar to carbon 14? <laughs> 14. <laughs> Well, I think you guys have to have our help to win the war. That's why, right there. Uh, I gotta say, laughter is the best medicine, and listening yeah. to you, Kent, is going to keep me living forever. I hope maybe so. To, maybe to nine hundred, <laughs> like uh, like our, our uh, father Adam. Uh, actually, okay, okay, George, did you have a question, brother? Uh, uh yeah, there was a question from uh, Landon Freedom, Freeman, but you may have to uh, help me out with the pronouncing pronunciation of some of these words it's he says it. uh he says some kinds some kinds have more genetic variability than others example the harvest man that's uh singular kind is relegated to harvest men plural alone through though the armadillo kind also includes the huge glyptodont so it looks like his question is, I'm looking at it here in the side chat, Dr. Hoven, and essentially he's asking, do some biblical kinds have more genetic variability than others? Maybe the, the potential to change more? Probably. There are 7,500 varieties of apples that have been developed now, and they might have had a common ancestor called an apple. Most of that is done by man trying to create a special breed for some special climate or special you know, soil or whatever, maybe they want it to be sweeter or more juice or, you know, farmers do this kind of stuff. They've been raising cows for uh, you know, more and more milk. Well, pretty soon they get cows that give a whole lot of milk. It's just utterly ridiculous how much they can give, but they can barely walk. They wouldn't survive 20 minutes out in the woods. So you got to babysit the herd now and keep everybody away from it. So yes, variations certainly happen. Some species seem to have more genetic variations available. Uh, but that's just a gene code thing. You know, how much, how many varieties can they get? I covered that a couple nights ago, uh, la two nights ago, whack an atheist on the different varieties of, there, there are 60 some varieties of oak trees. Okay. They might've had a common ancestor called an oak, 195 varieties of chickens. And they might've had a common ancestor. Some lay more eggs, some have more meat. Again, the further you get away from the norm, the more problems you have in some other area. Those that can lay a whole lot of eggs, don't live very long and you got to feed them like crazy and they got health problems. You got to give them, you know, medicine all the time. Doesn't happen in nature. They would never happen. Well said, Dr. Hoven. I watched that whack and atheist night and, and you did a great job. So I recommend everybody check that out. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start winding it down here with these last couple questions, because as always with you, uh, Kent, time flies by and we are already over the hour mark. So I want to get this one in here because it's directly related to your uh, lies in the textbook series. And the question is, uh, evolutionists now claim that vestigial organ simply means lost its original function or simply co-opted a new function, but still claim vestigial organs are real. They're still using that argument. What's the best way to respond to that, Ken? Well, I think vestigial organs is they say something you don't need anymore. Well, is that how evolution works? You keep losing things until you have it all? <laughs> I got a couple of things on my van with 175,000 miles that don't work anymore. Okay, that's kind of normal, isn't it? <laughs> 175,000 miles on. Uh, yeah, so I think vestigial structures is a lousy evidence for evolution because they're saying, oh, yes, we keep losing things and losing things until we have it all. Those guys ought to run for Congress. They could help them borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> yes, if, on, if we got lose enough money, we'll, we'll get rich. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you know if 
the University of Jena, where Ernst Haeckel went, is using that. Uh, ah, good, good point. Is University of Jena in Germany still using Haeckel's drawings? Yeah. Wow. Google that and see, bro. That'd be cool. <laughs> it, it's pretty sad that they're still using these arguments, even though they've been refuted so many, so many years ago, as you've pointed out, Kent. Uh, even um, one of the questions here has to do with an argument they're still using. I'm curious as to your thoughts. They, they're still claiming the existence of junk DNA. They say that most of our genome has no function, no known function, and therefore why would God create genomes of evolutionary leftovers? Is there any uh, validity to, to this whole junk DNA argument, Kent? The more people understand about DNA, the more research they do, the less junk DNA there is. It keeps the, oh, that's what it does. Tell you what, put a seven-year-old under the hood of your car and say, take out anything it doesn't need. He doesn't understand what none of it does. He'd take it all out. The fact that we don't understand it yet doesn't mean it's junk DNA. I would be willing to bet there is no, zero, none, no junk DNA. They just haven't learned the use for it yet. Sometimes there's redundancy because if something breaks, the new one takes the place right away. Why do you have a spare tire in your car? Is that junk? Mm. No, you may get a flat tire. So some of the DNA is for uh, instant repair. You know, you get something damaged. Wow, it's, it's right there to fix it. So it, it, I'd say there's no evidence that there's, there's no proof that there's junk DNA at all. Amen. I, I completely agree. The evolutionist would look to something like a spare tire as, as being useless. But as you pointed out, it's it's, it's essential. It's beneficial if you get a, a flat tire. Redundancy right. is good design. Okay, uh, George, did you have a final question here before we... Uh, start winding it down. I, I do want to point out to the audience that I know we've got a ton of questions. We've had a, a big chat tonight, but we did have uh, Dr. Hoven on two months ago for, for a presentation on the Garden of Eden and as well an audience Q&A. So a lot of these questions I see in, in the side chat, we answered in that show. So uh, please check that out as well after, after this. Uh, I, I apologize. Go ahead, George. Yeah, yeah. I mean, coming, coming from an engineering background, I've, I've actually studied computer science as well, and I've written numerous programs for design of uh, structural beams, etc. Uh, a lot of my programs contain tables and tables and tables of information. Now, a person who's not aware of um, my program would look at that those tables of information and think it was just junk, it was, wasn't doing anything. But it's very important because the program makes decisions based on the information that's in those tables. So this question of the junk DNA, I mean, we don't understand probably, well, I think we understand about 1% to 3% of what our DNA actually does or our genome does. So how, how can they claim that it's junk when they don't understand the physics and the intricacies of the genome? I think as we as we go through the process of um, examining and finding out more and more about the genome, we'll find that less and less of that so-called junk is actual junk. And right. I agree with I agree with Kent. I reckon they'll find out that it's probably zero or close to zero. Maybe if it's not zero, it's because some of it has been mutated to the point where it doesn't do much. Well said, George. I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody in the uh, audience. I appreciate all your support, your super stickers, your super chats, and uh, lots of kind words towards you, Kent. Uh, once again, I want to thank you so much for being generous with your time. We're now going on an, an hour and 10 minutes. It's been a great presentation, great uh, audience Q&A. I want to hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Hoven, if you had some final words, anything else you wanted to get out uh, pertaining to the topic. Well, none of this matters if you're going to hell. You can believe in creation, believe the Bible, believe the flood story, and not accept Jesus Christ. Many people are going to be Bible scholars in hell. They knew their Bible well, but they didn't accept the payment that God made. 52 years ago, someone said, Kent, are you going to heaven? I said, I don't know. I've been baptized, catechized, circumcised, homogenized, pasteurized. You know, what else you got to do? <laughs> they said, have you ever sinned? I said, well, yeah. I said, well, then you're going to hell. I said, no, wait a minute. Isn't God going to put my good against my bad and see which is, you know. They said, what judge on earth would do that? If you murdered somebody and your defense was, judge, it's true I murdered that guy, but look at all the people I didn't murder. 
Is that a good defense? No. If you committed one sin, you deserve to die and go to hell. So my friend said, Kent, you deserve to die and go to hell. And he showed me from the Bible, the wages of sin is death. And that Jesus Christ died for you. And if you're willing to accept his payment, you can be forgiven. So 52 years ago, I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And all the angels in heaven said, amen to that. <laughs> Lord, I believe you died for me, and I'd like you to forgive me and save me. And I would like you to come live in my heart. And something changed in Kent Hovind that day. I got born again. There's two, there's two of me in here. They fight all the time. I got the old one that loves to sin and the new one that hates to sin, and they fight all the time. Amen. So if you're not having that fight inside, you're probably not saved. <laughs> okay. So you can okay. ask the Lord to save you. Come on down. Call us, 855-BIG-DINO is our phone number, 855-BIG-DINO. I'm extension three. I take calls all day long and half the night. I shut it off uh, and I get to go to sleep. Uh, Kent, if you're interested, there, there are some really good images, sonar images of those trees in Spirit Lake in the standing position. Ah. Yeah. Well, now St. Helens knew all those trees in there. A lot of them began floating in the upright position and slowly yeah. sank to the bottom. They're going to petrify yes. standing up. Yes, and Steve Austin has actually done some sonar images of that uh, lake, and you can clearly see the trees in the vertical position, completely Amen. buried. All right. Amen. Now, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, sort of give you one of my final jokes here, Ken. Okay. <laughs> did you know? Did you know the history of boy bands proves the theory of evolution? They all history. descended. They all descended from the monkeys. Ah, the boy bands. <laughs> Well, that's a good place to end it uh, on a good note. And, and well said, uh, Dr. Hoven. Great final words. Uh, I, I always point out that's great evidence that, that you are saved if you have that war between the old man and the new man, the flesh and the spirit going on. Because as Christians, that's a struggle every single day. So well said, uh, Dr. Hoven. This was a great stream. Once again, I appreciate you giving us your time. And I know you got a boot camp coming up as well. So I'll, I'll be... Uh, Praying for that, brother. And uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you, George. Standing for Truth is out. God bless everybody. Great.